That one doesn't work. Oh, or that works too. Okay, good. good. All right. So, uh, so I'm John Parkinson. I'm from the Hospital for Sick Children. I'm a senior scientist there. Uh, work on parasites, genomes, and more recently, uh, many genomes, microbiomes. And what we've been focusing most on in terms of microbiomes is metatranscriptomics. So for those of you out there, how many people are actually generating metatranscriptomic data sets? Does anyone? All right, three people, superb. How many people are considering doing metatranscriptomics? Ah, that's very encouraging. And the rest of you, how many of you are thinking you sh you're wishing that there was an earlier flight or something? <laughs> All right, so um, I think what I'm, trying, what I'm gonna try and do today is to convince you uh, why you should be considering metatranscriptomics as part of your microbiome experiments. Okay, so these are the learning objectives of this module. So um, the idea is that at the end of this module, you will gain an appreciation of the opportunities, as well as the challenges that are inherent in metatranscriptomics. And hopefully do this by uh, giving you some kind of understanding of the capabilities, what metatranscriptomics can and can't do. Uh, gain an appreciation of sample collection. So some of the caveats when you're doing the sample collection, some of the important things that you need to take into account when you're doing the sample collection and also experimental design. Uh, but mostly we're going to be focusing on, because this is a biomedical workshop, uh, what are the important key steps for when you get your metatranscriptomic sequence data? What are the key steps when you're processing that? What are some of the problems, challenges that you can come across? And what can you expect to get from these data sets? So is, there, is it all um, a lot of promise or do you actually get something meaningful out of these kind of data sets? And then in the tutorial, um, what we put together is uh, a relatively simple metatranscriptomic data set with a whole bunch of scripts and tools to take you through the various steps that we go through in our lab uh, to process a metatranscriptomic data and to come out with uh, some kind of view so this is what we're kind of aiming for. All right, so the overview of the lecture. Uh, first of all, um, what is metatranscriptomics? How does it relate to RNA-seq? Uh, as I mentioned, experimental design, sample, collection, preparation. But then going through this processing with reads. So what are the filters? Assembly, why do we assemble? Uh, actually, I'm not going to mention the replication that's in the tutorial. Uh, and then get into areas of functional and potentially taxonomic annotation. And then briefly, statistical analysis and visualization. Okay, so over the past two days, you've been hearing a lot about metagenomics. So um, when we were starting to put this workshop together, um, all of the instructors were kind of scratching our heads as to, well, what do we mean by metagenomics? So is metagenomics purely DNA, whole shotgun DNA sequencing, or does it capture 16S as well? So there's, there's still this kind of, uh, I guess, taxonomy as to, or semantics as to whether metagenomics is really focused on 16S surveys, or whether it's, um, it should be focused on DNA. Irrespective, uh, the point of metagenomics, whether it's survey sequencing, or whether it's uh, whole DNA shotgun sequencing, is that you're trying to get an idea of the community makeup, either in terms of the species that are there, or in terms of what genes are there. So in terms of the 16S, although it can inform on the species that are present, it does have several drawbacks. So it doesn't provide much in the way of functional context, it doesn't tell you what genes are important, particularly even within whole, um, whole genome DNA sequencing. You can see which genes are there, but it doesn't tell you which of these are actively being expressed. Uh, in terms of the 16S surveys, different sets of species, you can identify the species, but even if you identify those species, we know that different strains can have completely different complements of genes. So that, for example, two species from a lactobacillus, uh, certain species of lactobacillus can vary by as many as 2,000 genes. And so knowing the species, what species are there, doesn't necessarily tell you what genes and potentially the activity of those genes within that sample. So relying on 16S sequencing um, can provide you species level information, but due to horizontal gene transfer, the gene complements, uh, even across uh, strains of the same species, can vary quite considerably. Uh, so conversely, rather than metagenomics or 16S surveys, metatranscriptomics really focuses on community activity. 
So here we're exploiting RNA-seq to really determine which genes, which pathways are being actively expressed within the microbiome sample. So the idea is that phenotranscriptomics is revealing the active functions. And it might be that you don't even care what tags are responsible. You might just want to know within this microbiome, what is this microbiome actually doing from a functional perspective? We don't care what species are in there. And I can show why that might be an issue later on. On the other hand, there's also a number of tools that are starting to come out which can reveal which taxa are responsible for active functions. So potentially what you can get is a kind of a view like this. So here we have a kind of network view of different genes that are involved in cell wall biogenesis. And you can have a simple view where the size of the actual nodes represents the relative abundance of those genes within this data set. But if you can reveal which taxa are responsible, then you can go to these more complex kind of views where these pie charts are actually showing the relative contribution of different taxa to these particular functions. So for example, these four functions here, you can see that this kind of pink pie, I think that's bacterioides in this particular case, are responsible for those particular functions. So you can start highlighting not just which functions have been actively expressed and which pathways have been expressed within your particular microbiome, but also what are the keystone taxa, what are the taxa which are critical to ensure that you have a proper functioning microbiome. So um, at this stage, does anyone have any questions on this first kind of blurb introduction? So I would encourage people to raise your hands when I'm going on and if you have anything that you want to clarify. Okay, so um, how do we apply RNA-seq? So RNA-seq, a lot of you are probably, who, who isn't familiar with RNA-seq? Okay, so, so there's a few of you um, who, who aren't, aren't, uh, aren't just familiar with RNA-seq. So RNA-seq is really just the unbiased sequencing of an RNA sample. So here we might get a sample from a mouse, a mouse gut, we extract the RNA, and basically, you're just randomly sharing, fragmenting all of the RNA within that sample, sequencing it, and then you're mapping it back to the genome of your uh, particular organism to identify which of the genes within that genome are actively being expressed within your sample. So it's taken over basically from microarrays. Around about 2008 or so, RNA-seq is really dominating uh, this area of gene expression. So rather than using uh, microarrays, uh, we're now uh, using relying more on RNA-seq to get an idea of expression levels of genes within the sample. And whereas um, uh, microarrays give you more of an analog kind of output, RNA-seq gives you a kind of digital readout of the relative expression of transcripts. Yes? Do you actually use sequence RNA or CDNA? Oh, we're actually sequencing RNA. Um, so it's typically, um, RNA-seq is typically applied to organisms with a reference. So it means that they've been sequenced already. So if somebody's doing an analysis of C. elegans and they want to see which genes are expressed in this worm under anoxic conditions, for example, then they'll extract the RNA and then they'll perform the RNA-seq experiment and then they'll identify um, which of the genes uh, are actually being expressed in that sample, relative abundance, uh, potentially isoforms as well. However, for microbiomes, we have a couple of challenges associated with this. So how do we what is the general idea here? So we have our mouse, we have a sample, might be a gut sample, we extract the RNA, and this RNA is going to have different relative abundances of transcripts from different species, so it might have four different species being represented in this microbiome. And you're just randomly fragmenting and sequencing each of these transcripts, and then you align all of these reads that are generated from the sequencer to known transcripts, and this will give you a relative expression. So you know that six of these reads back to this particular transcript so it has a relative expression of six, for example. So there's obviously a couple of challenges associated with this approach. So in a typical kind of RNA-seq experiment, uh, if you apply them to, say, eukaryotic, eukaryotic organism, you isolate the mRNA, you fragment, you sequence, and then read to map to a reference genome. Okay, and their standard software, such as Mac, BWA, which I think you've really um, using. And this gives you support that the transcript is expressed, and it also tells you what the relative abundance of that transcript is, and it can also tell you what the presence and abundance of different isoforms of that transcript might be. 
this is a typical human you might get. This is a, a gene here, this is a gene model, and then you've mapped on this track here, this genome track here, which shows you the relative abundance of reads and mapping to different regions of this gene. And this tells you that this particular gene is expressed at a certain level within this particular data set. Okay? So this works great when you have a reference genome for um, eukaryotes. However, microbiome samples are not eukaryotes, and we don't have reference genomes. So we face a couple of challenges. First of all, unlike eukaryotes, we don't have a poly A signal. So this makes it very difficult to isolate the mRNA from the ribosomal RNA. And this is a huge problem because uh, ribosomal RNA tend to be in huge abundance relative to the messenger RNA. Uh, the second challenge we face is that environmental samples, we don't have the reference genomes. Okay, so we can't do this kind of mapping as easily or as effectively as we can when we know the actual genome. Okay, so this is the pipeline uh, that we have for a typical metatranscriptomic analysis. So like the RNA-seq experiment, we um, maybe take your gut microbiome, we obtain the RNA, compare it for sequencing, we put it into a sequencing machine, we generate the reads, once we have the reads, we have to remove the low quality reads. We have to remove all the ribosomal RNA reads. We have to remove the host reads. And so the idea is that you have quite a lot of reads there. And then as you start going through these steps, you get fewer and fewer reads. Okay. So um, I would suggest that the number of reads there compared to the number of reads there that relative proportion is increasing as we're getting better and better tools, better kits uh, are appearing on, um, uh, <coughs> on, on, the, on the market, but there's still an issue of you're generating a whole bunch of reads and ultimately the bacterial mRNAs that you're getting out are in relatively low proportion. Yeah. Do you know of any ways to enrich your samples in non-RRNA? Right, so I'll, I'll get on to that. But there are kits that are available which do a reasonable job of actually selecting those things out, and I'll show that, I think, in the couple of slides. Sorry. That's all right. No, that's, that's obviously yeah, a... I mean, it's a huge yeah. issue, and, and yeah. so we need yeah, to know one of the like best... a huge waste of your... Uh, Absolutely. Efforts. Absolutely. Um, so once we have our final set of bacterial, putative bacterial mRNA reads, we then do an assembly, and I'll explain why we need to assemble. And then from this, from these contigs that we get from the assembly, as well as the singletons that don't actually map onto contigs, then we try and map these to known bacterial transcripts. And again, this is a bit of an issue, and I'll explain what we can do about that. And then finally, we can map to pathways and produce these kinds of nice pictures that um, uh, our bosses like, uh, because it shows that it looks nice and they can publish something. And then finally, you can do some kind of sample comparison to show that this kind of pathway in this sample is very different in terms of expression to, for example, uh, another sample. All right, so um, brief mention about sample collection, RNA extraction. Um, so one thing we find when we are working with different groups who are um, generating these data sets is um, an appreciation or a lack of appreciation from particularly MDs as to what kind of samples we can get and how we should store them um, to make sure that we have high quality RNA. So we know that RNA quality really deteriorates rapidly um, within a sample. So the best thing that we can do is to process these samples immediately to extract the RNA and then store it minus 80. Actually, the best, best thing that we can do is to process immediately, extract the RNA, make the libraries and then do the sequencing. But absent of that, if you can extract the RNA and then store the RNA at minus 80, then that's great. Uh, the next best is to do snap freezing and liquid nitrogen and then store at minus 80. Someone, yes? Uh, I was just wondering, with respect to the, uh, have, you, have you compared that to just storing it precipitated? Uh, no, we have not. Okay. So uh, we have tried 16, we, we did an experiment recently where we tried 16 different conditions. Um, of the actual storage of the raw material and then processing plus and minus of the RNA later. But we haven't, um, we haven't looked at just doing the precipitate, no. John, just a quick question. Do you um, 
So the, the RNA sec work I'm most familiar with is on pure cultures, uh, just exposed to different environmental conditions. We use R and A later for that. Right. Would it be as big an issue for that purpose as it is for the metagenomics? Um, potentially, potentially. So, um, so I so I state here that R and A later you should really think about avoiding its use. Because it does lie some cells, so some cells, some some of your bacterial cells are going to be more prone to the RNA later than others, and so that's going to enrich for certain species. But it can also interfere with these RNA extraction kits and potentially cause some biases in the sequences that you are actually able to extract. So it might be worthwhile doing a comparison of the plus and minus RNA later to see okay. what the actual. Yeah. Super important point. We we're working with a gram positive, so we're Okay. Yeah, but still. And it still might be yeah. impacting yeah. the subsequent downstream steps. Uh, in terms of cost per sample, it's not cheap doing better transcriptomics. So <coughs> we would suggest generating about 20 million units per sample. Uh, and I'll explain how we get to that number later. Um, but given, given this requirement to generate about, about 20 million units, uh, we're at a region of about three hundred to four hundred dollars per sample, so these are not cheap experiments. And main, the main part of these costs is actually the library kits for generating the libraries for sequencing. So even if sequencing is going to come down in price, uh, the cost of the kits is still going to remain relatively stable. And so we're probably not going to see uh, this cost coming down to the same kinds of levels that we have for 16S, where we're now at what about twenty-five dollars or thirty dollars a sample. So this is. These are kind of ex expensive experiments, and as a consequence, a lot of people are uh, very concerned about what number of biological replicates should we do. So we recommend at least two. Um, so metatranscriptomics, very much in its infancy. There's um, not that many studies that have been published so far. Those ones that have been published, uh, very few of them have more than two biological replicates. Many of them don't even have um, any replicates whatsoever. And so um, knowing what number of biological replicates, doing some kind of power analyses to see what kind of power you have in your experimental <coughs> design, this can be extremely challenging. So at the moment, I would suggest that um, we're at a stage with metatranscriptomics where we're really applying it to do hypothesis generation. I don't suspect that we have the power at the moment to have a real capability of identifying individual genes that really are statistically supported in terms of their relative expression compared with um, between samples. Okay, so going back to this issue of uh, ribosomal RNAs and extracting ribosomal RNAs, there are several kits that are available to remove the ribosomal RNAs. So you need to, your starting material needs to be around about 500 nanograms to 2.5 micrograms of RNA material. Depending on what you're working with, this may or may not be an issue. And this is one kit that we've had pretty good success with. It's Rivo Zero. So it used to be a Rivo Minus, but they've now got a Rivo Zero. Um, so here on the left-hand side of this graph, we have um, an experiment where they didn't do any RNA depletion and get 4.5 percent, which is um, mRNAs that are max the genome and then that 72%, which is ribosome RNA, so you can see the relative abundance of these two species within the sample. However, when you apply their kit, you kind of get a complete swap. And so you does just, according to their claims, does a really good job of uh, enriching for ribosomal, uh, for messenger RNAs. Uh, these are some samples that we've been um, processing and looking at and uh, feeding through our pipeline. Uh, so there's various mouse uh, samples here, uh, cow rumen, kimchi, deep seen, permafrost. And what we've got here in red, these red blocks are the proportion of ribosome RNAs that were identified from each of these samples. Uh, this gray one here is a DAT to low quality sequence of permafrost. There's a little bit sad here. I think about 99.5% was low quality data. Um, we also have host reads that we can identify. So these can be informative and it can tell you what the host is actually expressing in terms of the environment. So they can, they can actually be quite informative. But the ones that we're really interested in are these bacterial mRNAs and then these are these like root blocks. So we're 
in these kits, so we've used the Riva minus kit here. This, uh, I think it's an in vitro Nirvana kit. Uh, there's a microbe express kit. These were giving us around about 20% mRNA reads from our sample. With the Ribo Zero, I think we're now up to between about 30 and 40%, depending on the sample. Um, sorry, yeah? I just have a question about, um, I've used the Ribo Zero in the past, and I was wondering if you had any experience running into, I was working with an organism RNA, and so the ribosome didn't actually pull out those fragments. So when working with environmental samples, is there any kind of experience of that? Did you get an idea with the relative proportion of ribosomal RNAs that came out of that particular sample? There was quite a lot that still came out that worked with it, but for the 16S, there was still quite a lot left. Yeah. So did you tell you the manufacturer about that of the kit? <laughs> so yeah, I think these things, these kinds of caveats are going to crop up and these, so the Riber Minus came out in what, about 2009, the Riber Zero came out in about 2012, so it's going to be a continuous evolution of these kinds of kits. So uh, there's the, I think the latest one is the Riber Zero Gold Epidemiology Kit uh, that we're using for these, but again as you say there's, we're going to come across these instances where these kits just aren't going to work particularly effectively. Rob, did you? No, I was just trying to Oh, okay. Okay, so um, this might be better on, on your slide, but so these are 16 samples that we took. Uh, we looked at four different variables, temperature, storage, two different kits, RNA later. Um, and each of these pairs represent, um, in this case, temperature at four degrees versus 20 degrees, fresh versus one week. Zero versus micro express kit and plus or minus RNA later. And so on the left hand side of each of these pairs are samples that are stored at 4 degrees compared to 20 degrees. And unless you're storing it for uh, about a week, um, the actual storage temperature, 4 degrees is something to do with drop from minus 20. I guess this has got something to do with uh, thawing the sample after you've uh, frozen it, which causes some deterioration. Uh, fresh is better than storing it for one week, so again, the first of these pairs represents fresh, so you get a higher number of uh, mRNA reads um, when, you're just, when you're just processing fresh as opposed to leaving it for a week. Rover Zero Kit is better than Microbe Express, this is the right hand side of these pairs in each case, so I think in this particular case you get quite a significant difference in performance of Rover Zero compared to Microbe Express. And then RNA later seems to work. So again, this is the right hand of these two, of each of these pairs. Um, but uh, again, because of sample biases, uh, sequencing biases, uh, we don't really recommend the use of RNA later, in particularly in, in microbiome analyses. Okay, so that's as much as I want to say about sample preparation. Any further questions on that? In certain time series experiments, it's really impossible to have fresh only. Um, what do you recommend in that uh, scenario? Um, I mean, you could in, in, introduce a bias just based on that. So, say you have a time series experiment just running over a week, just here, like kimchi, for instance. You're monitoring the microbiome of kimchi day zero, day two, day four, day seven. So, here we're storing at minus 20, so um, I think the suggestion is to store at minus 80 and then to leave it for whenever, because you've got the considerations of the cost and you want to prepare all the samples at once, I imagine, to bring down the cost. Yeah. So store it at minus 80 and then when you're ready, bring them all out at once and do the preparation all at once. So we're facing uh, an issue. The last one, the day 7 you still stored it, so I put it down to minus 80 to not introduce that bias. Would be would be one thing. So may, maybe store them all for at least one week. Um, so this is this is an issue that we're facing with samples that are collected uh, from kids suffering from malnourishment in Malawi. And so this is obviously um, an issue when you're collecting samples in uh, countries that don't have necessarily the same facilities that we do uh, in in Canada and, and the U.S. And so. Fortunately, this is a welcome trust campus, and so they have access to minus 80 freezers. But if we were 
to think about getting stool samples that are then stored um, by um, the people as in, in their own homes, then there probably wouldn't be any point doing those kinds of experiments. So you really do have to make sure that you can get these samples as quickly as possible to appropriate storage conditions. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Would you comment more on the, uh, the, the effect of RNA later? Is that within the same source or in between, for example, environmental sample versus uh, human fecal sample? Is the, is the effect of RNA later within the sample? Or is, that is the effect? So, uh, I'm not sure that there's been any comprehensive studies that have been done to look at the differences between different types of environmental samples. So here, this is this is from a stool sample. Uh, so this is information from a colleague, Dan Frank, who's in Colorado, and his experience of RNA later is that when he's applying it to his stool samples, he finds that it's interfering with um, the processing of those samples. Yeah, it's widely recommended, right, for stuff that's in the ring. Well, yeah, but who's it recommended by? So, so yeah, we. I, th I think there's sufficient biases already put into doing these kinds of experiments that if we can minimise them and reduce these um, these kinds of um, artificial constraints on the sequences that we're generating, then the better. Um, so, which sample was this? So there was, a, there was a mouse sample that we'd applied one kit to, and we just didn't recover any Parabacteroides 16S sequences. And it was this kit, uh, I can't remember what it was, it might have been, might have been one, it might have been the Mervana kit, or it might have been the Ribo minus kit, but it resulted in the selective depletion of one specific bacterial, even though it was an mRNA enrichment kit, it removed Effectively, all the Parabacteroides 16S, but then some of the other 16Ss that were creeping through were still able to keep through. But then if you looked at the 16S distribution from that sample, right, then you saw a selective bias against that Parabacteroides. So it does make you wonder what other biases are these kits adding to your um, sample preparation. All right, so... We have our sample, hopefully it's a fresh sample, it's a nice sample, it's a lot of mRNA in there. How many reads do we need to generate? So this is a question that um, has kind of arisen um, and had a head scratching for a few years now. So we've been processing four of these different data sets, so it's a web transcript on deep sea data set, deep sea data set mouse data set, cow data set. Three of these were obtained from other labs and they're deposited in the sequence um, repository archive at the NCBI. The mouse data set we generated ourselves. And when we processed them, um, we were looking at the number of enzyme classification numbers that we could get within these samples. And so what we're showing here is a kind of a rarefaction plot where as we add in an increasing number of reads for each of these different samples, we're seeing how many new enzyme classification numbers, which we're using as a, a kind of proxy for enzymatic reactions, do we uncover at certain numbers of reads, so 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, and 8 million. And you can see that as you're generating more and more reads, you get more and more EC numbers. But we would suggest that round about here, which is about 5 million, gives you a reasonable approximation of the actual functional capacity, at least in terms of the enzymes that are being encoded within the sample. So um, we think around about 5 million mRNA reads provides around about 90 to 95% of the enzymatic activity, captures 90 to 95% of the enzyme activity within the microbiome. And so now with kits conservatively able to get up to about 25%, this is the Ribo Zero kit, this suggests that around about 20 million reads per sample is the minimum that you should be aiming for. So from a cost-benefit perspective, that's how we come up with this number of 20 million. So um, a lot of metatranscriptomic data sets that have been published up to about 
2012 or so, relied on 454 and potentially MySQL as well. So these can provide long reads, and these can be very useful for annotation, but they just don't give you the depth of coverage that you need. So if you're thinking you need to generate 20 million reads per sample, you're thinking about replicates, you're thinking about time series, you can see how the price of your experiment is going up. Uh, particularly if you need 454, it's really out of the question because you can only generate around about 500,000 reads. My seek you're generating around about 40, 50 million reads. So if you want to really have the capacity, we're suggesting high seek or next seek. And these are improving as well. These are able to capture longer and longer reads. Um, but these are the machines that you'd be thinking about to provide the sequencing depth um, that you really need to um, do sequencing. So have you already covered multiplexing as well? In a previous lecture, one nod here. Oh, sorry, not here. OK. So, so how many of you are familiar with this concept of multiplexing? So does anybody want me to explain multiplexing? Okay, good. So, the I, so just briefly for those people who um, aren't familiar with multiplexing, this is where you can add a barcode onto each of your sequences that you're generating sequence for. And this enables you to combine many different samples within a single sequencing run, brings down the cost, and then there's bioinformatics pipelines that enables you to deconvolute each of those reads into their respective bins of the samples that they were derived from. I have a question about um, the five million read estimate. Yeah. Um, do you know if this holds true for soil? I don't know how soil compares to deep sea, but it's uh, really diverse in the soil. Um, so we, ha we had permafrost in there, which is. I think it So we don't know because we haven't analyzed a soil metatranscriptome, so we can only go on the deep sea, uh, which was a very rich and very diverse environment. So we would suspect that the deep sea is potentially going to be, we don't know, I mean it depends, maybe, Rob, do you know how diverse deep sea is compared with soil? Order of magnitude. All right. So, so again, we're limited in our in our estimation by the samples that we're actually processing. It. Yes. I kind of just wanted to follow that because with that rare factor that is based on. Exactly. Yes. There's also potentially a a compounding factor here that you can keep on sequencing more and more and more and more. And what you're actually picking up isn't necessarily a real enzyme activity, it's just noise in the system that you're getting a random match to a particular enzyme that's in your database. So that's another consideration that you might want to bear in mind. So um, when we look at these kinds of very low abundant kind of ECs and what they're involved in, um, it's not clear that they're playing any meaningful role within, as you suggest, uh, these, these kinds of um, core pathways. And they seem to be involved, a lot of them are secondary metabolism or xenobiotics or things that are just adding on and not necessarily connected to the entire metabolic network. So it's not, it's not clear how meaningful these, re these, these low abundance enzyme reactions that we're picking up uh, within these data sets really are. So again, that's another consideration. But if you are motivated, if you're not motivated by cost, then you can go 20, 50, 100 million. But if, if you want to get the best bang for your buck, then we would suggest around about 20 million. OK, so we've generated or Yes? So from practical, you know, in eukaryotes, it's a different thing. The you, you specifically 
do our nesting on a space they caused, you don't worry, you know, there are more abundant, you have a technique to smooth that. But in, in microbiome transcription, you have a different cost. There is an ortholoidin, homoloidin. How, you know, where you build the coating from the practical perspective, how you, you know, know um, that particular gene aside from this one, that one, that one. You know, how do it sort out later or down the line? From the practical perspective, I never did um, a transcript from meta genomics, but I know from human it's, it's a different issue. You are that is a specific cost, so you know you you figure out down the line with it all in this perspective. I don't know how you know um, the homolog if you sequence the entire thing from you know a pool of environmental sample. How do you know you know where that comes from? like for similar genes. So, so the question if, and correct me if, I, if, yeah. I, if I'm misinterpreting this, yeah. but the question is, once you've generated the sequence data, yeah. how do you know that what you're getting out is coming from a particular taxon? Yes, yes. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll attempt to get to that right okay. later on. In some cases, you might not care and you might just be interested in identifying the functions associated with a microbiome so that you can predict maybe the metabolic capacity of that microbiome, and that metabolic capacity might feed into, for example, changing the metabolism of the host, which could then inform, for example, a disease, a certain type of disease. Um, but in other cases, you might want to know what those uh, taxon, what the taxa might be, and there's a number of programs out there which do a reasonable job of assigning breeds to the taxon, and I'll go through that right at the end of the talk. Okay, so we've generated our reads, um, so we now want to go through the entire pipeline of processing, filtering, annotating from a functional perspective as well as a taxonomic perspective. Okay, so... Um, these pipelines are again very much in their infancy, still very much being developed. Uh, new tools uh, are being uh, benchmarked to see which ones appear to perform better than others in terms of analyzing these data sets, not introducing biases. So I'm going to introduce our current pipeline that we use in our lab, but again, this is uh, an evolving uh, kind of field, if you like. So the first thing that we need is to remove low quality sequences, so trimomatic. Uh, was this covered in a previous lecture at all? No. Okay. So Trimomatic, it's from a um, research group in France, and it's kind of taken over, I think, um, in a lot of uh, next generation sequencing platforms um, to do trimming of low quality reads. It's incredibly quick, and when you do your tutorial, you'll, see, you'll just see how quick it actually is. Um, so... Uh, basically, it uses this sliding window approach um, from the five prime end, from the three prime end, identifies low quality. Sorry, so it starts with five prime end and it looks for low quality regions. Um, and most low quality is occurring at the three prime end, and so as it's scanning across, it uses this kind of sliding window until it can identify a chunk where it's low quality, and then it just says anything beyond that is going to be low quality, and so it removes it. Once it's removed, it sees what the size of the uh, the main read is if it's below 36 base pairs, or well, this is tunable, then it's just discarded. Uh, the important thing is that it, it's just an, in, you can write your own scripts to do this kind of thing, but Trimomatic is incredibly fast, so um, we would recommend using Trimomatic. It also has a capability of trimming off adapters, so you can screen against um, the different sequencing adapters. So when you're doing the library preparation, you're adding on bits of sequence, artificial sequence, to either side of your. Um, um, sequences, and sometimes these are actually captured in the reads that you're generating, so these need to be removed. So these are these kinds of adapters. You can also get vector, depending on how you've made your library, you can also get plasmid vector um, sequence also within your particular material, and again, it's important to remove those. Um, so Trimomatic has that capability. We've been using Crossmatch, so the tutorial that we'll um, use um, will uh, use uh, Crossmatch. Uh, we've been using Crossmatch for 
15 years, so it's going to be hard for us to swap to Trimmatic. But uh, Trimmatic looks as though it's the new Cadena block and it seems the one that's uh, out competing a lot of these other programs in terms of uh, being incredibly quick at processing through uh, hundreds of millions of reads and getting rid of all the rubbish that's in there. Um, we also have an issue with host material under certain uh, microbiomes. So again, if you're sequencing um, gut material from a mouse, you're going to have some mouse reads in there. So you want to remove, identify and remove those kinds of host sequences. So for that, some like BWA and BLATS offer uh, useful alternatives. And again, we have a lot of this ribosome RNA. This needs to be filtered out so we can use uh, tools such as uh, BLAT. And Infernal. Um, so Infernal is uh, one that we use because it's incredibly sensitive. Uh, and it's able to pick up a lot of these ribosome RNA sequences that doing just simple blast searches or black searches, just don't pick up. Uh, the problem with Infernal is that it's based on a hidden Markov model profile search, uh, and so it's incredibly slow. And so when we switched over into Infernal, where we have a allocation on a supercomputer cluster at Toronto, um, and we seem to be chuntering through that very, very quickly using Infernal. So it does require an awful lot of processing power, unfortunately. Right, sort me RNA. Sort me RNA. No, that sounds like something we should explore. Yeah. It scans for several different kinds of R RNA. Pretty good. Okay. Uh, one thing we've tried to do with Inferno is to break down the species of um, of ribosomal RNAs that we're trying to capture because the Infernal database has a lot of these non-coding SNRNAs, SNOR RNAs, and so forth, and they really slow things down. But even if we just focus in on certain species, it still seems to be relatively slow. But we shall have a look at your suggestion. Okay, um, so we've filtered out all of, hopefully, the stuff that we don't want. We're hopefully left with stuff that we do want, which are these putative messenger RNAs from our bacteria. Um, the next step that we suggest is assembly. So this is where we take all of our putative mRNA reads, we do an assembly step, um, and the idea is that we want to assemble because it improves annotation accuracy. So here we have contig length, uh, 40 to 60, up to 80, up to 100. And then as we start getting over 100, the number of reads that we can actually annotate really gets very close to around about 80, 90 percent. Okay, so once you pass over 150 base pairs or so, you're in a very good um, um, area for actually being able to annotate and identify a sequence match to your read. And so if we can assemble relatively short reads into these longer contexts, it really does enhance our capacity to annotate these reads. So we performed a comparison of three assembly tools made available at RACs and Trinity, and we find that Trinity, in terms of the percentage reads that could be mapped to uh, a known gene using BLAST, about about 50% of the reads after assembly with Trinity in this particular data set, if this was a mouse um, gut data set, and around 50% could be annotated after we've gone through this assembly step. So it really gives us a better capability of being able to annotate these reads. Now, yesterday, there was a comment that uh, chimeras can be a bit of an issue, particularly if you consider that a lot of these mRNAs are going to be homologs for maybe closely related species, and they could all get merged together. We've done some testing on this using simulated data sets so that we can actually identify what, what truth is. And again, um, looking at a couple of different diverse data sets, one with, I think, 10 tax or one with maybe about 100 or 200 tax are in. And we find that chimeras don't seem to be that much of a problem. We get um, around about 3 or 4%, I think, of the context that we get out look as though they might be chimeric. Uh, 
And again, if you're not too worried about knowing the specific contributions of the tax or revenue sample and you're more interested in the functions, this probably isn't really a issue anyway. So it's only when you're interested in knowing what the specific tax or revenue sample are that this becomes a problem. Uh, what was interesting with Trinity when we applied it to the deep sea data set is uh, the most abundant uh, contig that we got out was, uh, it was a very long contig, it was around about 40,000 base pairs or so. And this was fantastic. Trinity's done an incredible job of assembling this amazing read that we found in this deep sea sample. And we looked at it and it's getting excited and some kind of phage. It's kind of like, well, phage is incredibly abundant within this deep sea data set. And then it turned out it was phi x. So, <laughs> for those of you who are familiar with sequencing, phi x is, who aren't familiar with sequencing, uh, the phi x is the actual spike in that you, um, that you do when you, um, uh, for quality control purposes, draw the sequencing set. But nonetheless, I think it showed the power of applying the Trinity assembler that, despite all the other rubbish, or the, shouldn't say rubbish, but all the other reads, all the diversity that was in the messenger RNAs within this sample, this assembler is still able to regenerate and reassemble the entire genome of an entire phage. So I think it, it, it really demonstrates the fidelity that you can get with these kinds of um, assembly programs. All right, so uh, on to the next challenge, functional annotation. Um, so functional annotation, if we were doing a genome, a new genome, um, you might hope that you have a whole bunch of collaborators who could go into the lab and explore the individual functions of the genes that you identify within that genome and do these experiments and so forth. I think as you do more and more genome projects, people aren't interested in doing those kind of follow-up functional characterizations. So really, I think the only way that functional annotations are performed these days on any scale beyond 100 genes or more it's really through these automated sequence similarity search tools. And so we're reliant on tools such as BWA, BLAST, BLAST, and all of the hybrids that are coming out, um, which are trying to improve the speed of BLAST. Um, so BWA, BLAST, these are extremely quick tools. Uh, they can be very effective <laughs> if you have a reference genome. So we don't have a reference genome. And the issue that we face here is that sequence diversity in these samples is absolutely huge. So this is, uh, again, a rarefaction plot of, uh, I think, Streptococcus agalacti. This was 2008. They sequenced 14 different strains. Every time you sequence a new strain, you end up with a whole bunch of new genes associated with that strain. And so I think this really points at the amount of diversity that you have that is actually out there. So BWA, BLAT, which really rely on being able to identify near-perfect matches, just aren't going to be very suitable for these kinds of environmental samples. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of this diversity is really occurring at the nucleotide level, so if we can work at the protein at the peptide level, then we can be a lot more successful. So our solution has been to work in peptide space and to use BLASTX. Uh, so there are faster flavors of BLASTX, there's U-Search, uh, there's M-Blast, there's Diamond, that we heard yesterday, Diamond we have to uh, do some quality control checks over. U-Search unfortunately has some issues over the cost, um, M-Blast um, seems to have some interesting issues over the quality of the matches that it's producing, so while it's fast, the quality of what you get out isn't as high to get from BLASTX. So at the moment we're relying on BLASTX, but this is obviously a huge problem. So if we can switch over to something like diamonds, then that uh, provides a greater capability. So these are our five data sets, mouse, QG, cow, deep sea, permafrost. Um, and then we're looking at the proportion of reads that we can annotate with these different tools, BWA, BLAT, BLAST. So even with BLAST, so these are these orange lines, you can see that these light blue segments here, these are the ones that we just can't map. And so you end up with only 30% of your putative messenger RNAs which you can actually annotate, which is again, a little bit sad when you think as to how much sequence data you started off with and you're filtering and filtering and filtering, 
and you only end up in terms of the deep sea with only 30%, less than 30% of your actual putative mRNA reads, can you actually annotate something at all? Uh, kimchi is a bit of an exception here. Uh, this is because in the kimchi data set they actually did um, sequencing of the eight major taxa that formed the kimchi community. So they kind of cheated a bit because they did have like reference genomes um, for the kimchi sample. So one approach you might want to consider is in addition to doing uh, metatranscriptomics, maybe you want to think about doing a metagenomics run as well. So you do a whole genome shotgun of your microbiome, and then you can use that to do your reference mapping. Is there any questions on this aspect of annotation? Just want to mention that when we do look at the matches that we get through glass, so this is a typical match for central one pair read, really. looks pretty good. But you look at the expect value and it's 39. Okay? It's not e to the minus 39, it's a expectation value of 39. So the statistics behind this are obviously a little bit flawed. However, the species, this is for the mouse sample, the bacterial species, this looks about right. And so when we look at all of our blast matches, um, we find that we get a large proportion which are kind of in this region here. And so we use this to define our cutoff. We don't use e value as a cutoff. We say that we require a certain, I think it's, uh, what is it, 90 or 85% uh, sequence identity. Sorry, it's 70% sequence identity over 85% uh, of the sequence length. So this is what we use as our cutoff for defining a sequence match that we'll use in our pipeline. Okay, so we've got our reads, we process them, we've done some kind of annotation, we've mapped them to some kind of known gene. We now want to have some kind of expression associated with that gene that we've been able to identify. So with RNA-seq, we have this term, reads duplicate base of transcript uh, per million base pairs um, and a mat. Um, so the expression is biased for gene length. So here we have a relatively long gene. We have eight reads mapping to it. Here we have a relatively short gene. We also have eight reads mapped to it. So because this is a relatively short gene, you're less likely to find a read that's associated with this relatively short um, uh, transcript. And so you do this correction. So the expression, this RPKM, is really trying to normalize and count these differences in the relative length of these transcripts. And so when you look at the RPKM, you see that this one is really the most um, highly expressed gene um, relative to these other two after this kind of normalization step. Uh, so there's a number of software tools that are available to do this mapping and to calculate normalized uh, measurements, so bow tie and cut links. Um, we actually have a custom script that we use to actually do this ourselves. So it's a relatively trivial calculation, which was shown here. But, uh, oh, okay. It's in the notes. They can see it. Uh, I think it might say 10 to the 9 in the notes as well. That should be 10 to the 6. Um, okay, so we have the annotation to the genes. We have the relative expression. What about taxonomic information associated with this mapping? So um, how can we think about extracting that taxonomic annotation? Should we even be using it? So one argument as to why we don't necessarily need to worry about the taxonomic contributions is uh, this was a study from the Human Microbiome Consortium in 2012. So across the bottom here are different samples from different individuals. And then in this top graph you've got different pilot, uh, distributions of different pilot within each of these different samples. And they've been split into these different pilot regions of stool, uh, mucosa material areas and so forth. And you can see in terms of the actual taxonomic uh, composition, um, there's a huge amount of diversity across each of these samples. Okay, so uh, different individuals have huge variants in the actual uh, taxonomic groups that are associated with different parts of their body. But when you look at the actual function, so in this case they've looked at metabolic pathways, 
as in the fundamental point path rate purely metabolism, ribosome, and synthesis, and so forth. You can see that each individual pretty much has a similar complement of functions. So this is kind of suggesting that the actual community makeup isn't um, necessarily that um, uh, informative as much as the actual functional competition. So despite these huge variances in uh, the actual taxa that are present within the sample and the diversity that's inherent across samples, the actual functions that all these different communities are producing are pretty similar from uh, region to region. So this is one argument as to why we might not want to get so hung up on specific species. Uh, on the other hand, assigning um, RNA reads might, recreate, might reveal some kind of critical functions that only one taxon might be producing, so the so-called keystone taxa. Uh, another reason as to why we might want to think about assigning uh, taxonomic labels to our RNA reads is that it could help in a previous step in terms of binning reads in assembly and preventing the formation of these chimeras. Okay, so there are arguments pro, um, pro and against um, doing this kind of taxonomic annotation. Any questions on? Yes. I was just wondering, with respect to that, um, are there any informatics tools or approaches that you're aware of that attempt to sort of score pathway ubiquity to sort of flush out things that may not be contributing to, say, physiological or experimental difference that you may be seeking? So to identify... So basically ranking a pathway on how globally it's occurring or how unremarkable based on the a priori strategy in terms of, say, samples. Um, so that you're not necessarily interested in that particular yeah. function? Yeah, exactly. So this is a ubiquitous function that's found in every single microbiome or... Yeah. Um, no. So... We've been analyzing a lot of different metabolic pathways from a lot of different organisms, and we find that um, even within, say, one phylum, and we've looked at about 20 different species of protists that are coming from the same phylum, each of them are using subtly different ways of doing similar things. So they have slightly different complements of enzymes to achieve even central metabolic processes. So I think it would be pretty difficult to screen those kinds of common functions out because they do nonetheless form these important yeah. connections that I, bridge I'm across. I'm not really intending that as sort of a rigorous, like, we are just going to say this is not important, but I mean just in a way of, as a way of kind of tailoring towards a supervised analysis, I guess, if you're trying to figure out where the differences are, you know. But as you said before, if you have a central pathway, you can't slight yeah, these, so so that cut, that that feeds more into the downstream systems analyses where you're trying to identify groups or groups of enzymes that are working together in one sample, which is subtly different to the connections that you find in a different sample. So we, I'll touch on that briefly. Hopefully, correct me if I or bring it up again if I if I haven't covered it a bit later. Okay, so there are some tools out there that enable you to do some sort of taxonomic annotation, and Rob's been working on a pipeline, and we've been working on our pipeline, and there's a couple of others that have been produced. Um, so one approach might be to use something such as RAS BWA, uh, but these can fail when you lack suitable reference genomes, and they can get horribly confused as well. So RAS BWA um, aren't particularly precise um, when they are doing their taxon assignments. On the other hand, um, rather than sequence similarity methods, you can think about compositional methods. So you can look at things like nucleotide frequencies, carbon biases, and so forth. So here we might have a sequence, and we chop it into, in this case, uh, frequencies of genes. So a very single freeway you have some kind of distribution. And then you might have some kind of approach, like a nearest neighbor method, and within the center of each of these, this is called a Uroni plot, and it basically covers each of these voxels um, in the center of the individual genome. 
and then everything within this voxel is closer to that particular genome than anything else. And so that's what these kinds of um, uh, boundaries represent. Right? So if something falls within this particular region here, then it's closer to that particular genome than it is to another genome. And so you can take these kinds of distributions, map them into this kind of drawn space, and you can identify what the nearest neighbor is. What is most similar, what genome has the most similar um, composition in terms of the distribution of all these different um, codons um, to all these different genomes that you have in your um, multidimensional plant. Okay, so there's a number of different methods. Nearest neighbor is just one. There's uh, various Bayesian and um, uh, mixture models and so forth that you can use to take these kinds of distributions and make a prediction as to which genome your particular read is closest to. Um, perhaps most successful is this one called the Naive Bayesian Classifier. Um, it does a very good job. It relies on these distributions of 25ers. Um, now, if you have a 25er, that's a really good signature associated with genome. Um, the point of NBC, though, is that uh, it really requires uh, very good reference genomes or very, very similar genomes so that you can pick up these signatures that are 25er long. A uh, new one that's around is Medicine B, um, and this uses Emma frequency profiles again. And then um, Rob has a <coughs> trial called Rita, which combines these blast searches but also uses these colon bias um, and nucleotide distribution metrics as well. Uh, we've been creating one called GIS, which is what I'm going to push on to you guys uh, today. So this is a uh, again, it's like NBC, Rita, um, NBCV. Um, it's a pipeline to annotate your reads to a uh, specific taxa. And the idea behind GIS is that it integrates several methods. Um, but the unique aspect of GIST is that it assigns unique, unique, the unique aspect of GIST is that it assigns different weights to methods for each genome. So it's tailoring for each genome which method is best able to discriminate sequences associated with, with that particular genome from all the other genomes that are out there. So it enables you to discriminate, if you like, um, in the best way, the sequence associated with each of the different genomes that you have. I'm not going to go through this pipeline here. It's kind of <coughs> now. Um, the other thing that we do is it can take an expected sequence distribution. So if you've done a 16S survey, and this can give you the relative distribution of each of your uh, taxa within your sample. You can use that as a prior, if you like, to help guide the assignment of your read. So if you see an awful lot of 16S associated with parabacteroides, then just will take that into account and suggest that if you have a choice between parabacteroides and something else, it will prefer to go to parabacteroides. So just to demonstrate um, how we assign different weights to uh, different genomes. So along the bottom here, we have five different genomes. And then these bar charts represent the weights that are associated with each of these different methods. So we have, um, we have eight methods, and then we have BWA as well, just in case we are able to match to a known genome. And then depending on each of these genomes, so for example, the Julian de Facile strain 630, we find that this naive Bayes uh, approach that relies on amino acid distributions is a good way of discriminating the Julian de Facile compared with uh, these other genomes. On the other hand, some like Streptococcus A-lacti strain A909, just another example, prefers to use this uh, uh, Gaussian mixture model associated with these amino acid distributions. So what this approach is doing is really tailoring which of these methods is best able to discriminate, or combinations of methods with these different weights, are best able to discriminate that genome and separate it out and discriminate it from all the other genomes that are out there. Okay, so this is a graph of performance when we're comparing GIST with MenaCV and NBC. So MenaCV has this unfortunate capacity to give up and just make things as unclassifiable. So if it's not able to identify something, say, oh, I, I give up. Um, and 
doesn't even come out of the best, yes. Uh, MVC, um, this is a community from this uh, non ob diabetic model. This was grown under germ-free conditions. It was inoculated with this altered Schedler flora. So this is supposed to be a community of eight different bacterial species. MVC seems to classify a lot more than eight different species. And then this is our program here, and I think we're doing a reasonable job in terms of identifying what are in these three different, so we've got three different samples, three different types here. And I think we're doing a reasonable job in being able to uh, assign each of our reads to uh, specific taxonomic classes. But again, to mention that MBC works incredibly well if you have a reference genome. But because of genetic diversity uh, and its reliance on large camas, then it can be problematic. So this is really striking. So 501, right, it's the same sample across just three different um, programs. Yes. They're, they're, like, it's extremely different from just the meta CV. Can you explain like why the assignment would be so different between the two? Because they look like two completely different samples. Uh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's a little bit worrying, isn't it? It is. <laughs> because if you're running these kinds of pipelines and you're running this tool and then you're expecting this to be truth, and you're publishing it, uh, it's a little bit of an issue. Um, yeah. CV and NBC look at least more similar, just the proportions are different. Yeah, it's just totally different. Right. So I need you to explain yourself. So a big issue for GIST is this parabacteroides. So the Parabacteroides, if you remember, um, I mentioned it got selected out in our mRNAs and the ribosomal RNAs um, that we were able to capture from those experiments. So as a result, GIST wasn't expecting to see any Parabacteroides. However, when we then, when we go back and spike in the Parabacteroides, then we are able to capture it a bit better. Um, in terms of uh, well, Staphylococcus for one, so this has a large chunk of Staphylococcus. Uh, you can't find it in Meta CV, but GIST has it as well. So you can identify regions where there are some similarities and there are some differences between them. Um, yeah. I mean, here we have a large chunk of parabacteroides. Maybe this is doing a pretty useful job of parabacteroides compared to here. Or maybe these are just grouping them um, into parabacteroides when in fact they should be clostridia. I think, I think an issue is that MetaCV hasn't done a very good um, way of identifying clostridia. So that's so yeah. So I think that's that's one of the areas that MetaCV hasn't done so well on is identifying those from clostridia. Uh, NBC seems to have split a lot of these into um, more groups as well. So there should only be eight different taxa in here, so it's kind of splitting. Musis furinum is one that we should expect to see. And we know that there, there's bacteroides in there and parabacteroides. But we also know that there's some clostridia as well. So again, it's not really been, I think it might be urea. Um, so it's not able to pick up, I think that's urea. Uh, so it's not able to pick up the same number of clostridia that that just is. So we're looking at a ground truth of this because they've recently just published the genomes of the altered Schedler flora, so we'll actually be able to see what has actually happened and how consistent are each of these taxonomic bins here or here or here, and how do they map to the actual known genomes? So are we finding that, for example, Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, they all map to just one genome, for example? Whereas Durea, all these Durea sequences are actually also mapping to that same genome. Yes? Yeah? <laughs> Sorry. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the main issues here we have is that we have short reads, right? so it's very hard to analyze. So, what about generating a long term transcriptomic data with that genomic, which is easier to be a sample way to get longer reads and then annotate your metagenomic data? Then back to reads, so you can get the same sort of answers, but 
So yeah, so, so as I mentioned earlier, you might want to consider running a metagenomics um, whole shotgun DNA run in addition to your uh, RNA sequencing run as well for exactly that reason. So um, one of the things which is said is it doesn't have a reference genome. Um, have you tried to you know do the pack bio uh, sequencing, which is give you you know longer read, use that as a reference, you know on the same thing in the map to that probably you know you, it, it probably captures you know the problem we see here, like you know, smaller thing. Right, I, I'm not sure that necessarily need to go to PacBio, you can probably just do a NetSeq uh, whole genome DNA shotgun analysis. I think that would probably be sufficient. So that would again potentially get over some of these problems as well. Um, so in terms of what we actually get out of the uh, relative expression that of these mRNAs that are associated with these different uh, taxa. Here we're comparing between the 16S distributions that we see with the taxonomic distributions of these that we're calculating. This is just using BLAST. Um, and we do notice some, well, not quite so subtle differences in the abundance. So, one issue is that there might be biases in the ribosomal RNA sequencing, it might be biases in the mRNA sequencing, or it might just be that we have a large number of reads here that are associated with Clostridia, for example, these purple lines, we have far fewer um, in the 16S um, distribution. Uh, the expectation is that maybe the 16S is picking up a lot of um, um, taxa that aren't necessarily very active. So um, you're actually seeing these things that are very abundant within the microbiome but they're not actually necessarily contributing to the function of that microbiome. And so again, this might encourage you to think about performing um, metatranscriptomics. Okay, we're getting close to 10 o'clock. I would suggest that I would wrap up um, the remainder of this lecture and then we will take a coffee break before doing the tutorial. Is this acceptable to everyone? Okay, good. Alright, so we have this fantastic pipeline. It's processed hundreds of millions of reads. You know what genes all these reads come from. You know what taxa they're coming from. How do we visualize this information? How do we actually get something new for our so once we've assigned them to all the transcripts, we can think about exploring their function, and um, we've seen quite a few of these nature and science papers which produce these kinds of bar charts, of, in this case, these gene ontology categories. Um, does anyone have any opinions on these kinds of displays where, that you keep seeing from these, whether it's metagenomics or metatranscriptomics? Do you find them informative? So these tend to be incredibly broad kind of categories. Yeah, so you've got, okay, one sample might have more genes associated with energy production and metabolism, or fewer genes associated with lipid transport and so forth. What does that actually mean? You're not really getting to what's happening at the molecular level. And so um, I think what we need to do is really go beyond thinking about these COG categories and GO categories and keg pathways for classifying each of our reads into and saying that well, there's a functional difference here because this particular large process is up or down regulated. And maybe going to something which is more of a systems level, more of a kind of a molecular level kind of detail uh, to try and get some more meaningful uh, information out of these data sets. So beyond focusing on these broad functional categories, we might start thinking about undertaking these systems-based analyses. And this is coming from the perspective that we know that genes don't operate in isolation. They really form part of these very complex, intricate kind of functional modules, if you like. So they can form parts of protein complexes, they can form parts of metabolic 
pathways, they relate networks, or even signal networks. And so the idea is, if we can place our bacterial transcripts within the context of these different networks, can we understand something more about the microbiome at a functional level? And so there's a number of different systems that we could think about mapping our information onto. So one thing that we've been exploring a lot of are E. coli homologs. Okay, so we have a protein-protein interaction map for E. coli. So this is our model bacteria, and we have this protein interaction map, which acts, if you like, as a global overview of how each of the proteins within E. coli are organized into complex, organized into functional modules, organized into complexes. And so what we can do is we can take our metatranscriptome data, we can take those transcripts that we identify, and we can turn those transcripts into E. coli homologs, we can identify the E. coli homologs, and we can map the information from those transcripts and the expression into these networks. Okay. So that's what we've kind of done on the right hand side here, is we've taken these kinds of networks and this shows the relative conservation. So, so the views on the left show the relative conservation of different proteins within these um, different modules. So this is a module genes involved in cellular biogenesis. These are modules of genes involved in select transporters, and these are in module of genes involved in biotransport. transport. And you can look at how well conserved um, uh, some of these proteins are, and that might give you an indication of what is the expectation that you would identify these things in some the first place. Maybe get to that one of your earlier questions. Um, but we can map on the abundance of uh, mRNA transcripts, and it's not an obvious mapping between the relative abundance and the conservation, because if everything's just random, we would expect when we map our expression data onto these networks that these patterns should be the same, but they're not, because we do find, for example, these ones which are well conserved aren't necessarily well represented within that data set. Okay, so this is giving us an idea that these kinds of approaches are actually informative. So we can take our transcripts, we map them onto, or we identify the E. coli homologs, we use the RPKM values associated with those transcripts, and we can get the relative abundance of the genes within these particular pathways. So we're using the E. coli protein-protein interaction network, if you like, as a proxy for understanding some of the pathways, some of the complexes, some of the systems that are present and abundant within our data set. So does that make sense? Um, so by using this kind of network approach, we can start thinking about identifying um, genes or systems that might be upregulated in, for example, a disease individual versus a healthy individual. Uh, this requires some kind of development of statistically robust platform gene set enrichment analyses, for example, might offer one possibility to do this. Uh, these are things that are currently being developed. Uh, we're thinking about this network approach to identify groups of genes that share common functional linkages. So, for example, these five genes here are part of the tryptophan operon, but you can see that these two genes are particularly highly expressed, these three are. Okay, so you might suggest that because some are not expressed, some are very well expressed, might not be statistically significant true samples. However, if we look at these other genes here, which are connected to these genes, but not necessarily connected to these two genes over here, you might infer that this represents a functional module, that the group of this genes that aren't necessarily part of what was defined by PEG or GO or gene ontology. Um, by using this kind of network approach, you can look at the connections between these genes and infer your own kind of relationships and your own kind of um, groups that may be differentially regulated um, from a more biologically meaningful perspective. Yes? So, so this, uh, this was a network of protein-protein interactions that was generated in 2009. Uh, so this was a combination of uh, a tap-tagging proteomics approach where you take a E. coli protein, you have a tap-tag, uh, 
you put it through a column, and so everything that is interacting with that protein is also stuck to this column. You elute it, and that elution goes into a mass spec, and so you identify that protein plus all the other proteins that are associated with it. So that's one data set that feeds into this network. Then there's uh, operon analyses. So this is where genes that are involved in the same operon tend to be functionally associated. We have phylogenetic profiles um, where if a gene is found in the same sets of taxa, then they tend to be interacting. There's gene fusion analyses. This is where if you have two proteins in E. coli, which are separate proteins, but then in another organism, they're actually fused into one individual polypeptide unit. That's again indicative that they have a uh, uh, that they have some kind of functional association. So we combine a whole group of these different methods to build this kinds of network. Uh, so there's also the string database, uh, which is um, uh, presented by uh, I think it's M Emble uh, Pair Group Pair Group. Uh, again, functional associations between bacteria. Here, this is just focused on E. coli, and this is one of the limitations of this approach, is that we are going to non-identify proteins and systems that are associated with the taxa that we might find in our particular microbiome. And so, we don't have a protein interaction network for bacillus, we don't have a protein interaction network for streptococcus, we don't have a protein interaction network for anything really, uh, apart from E. coli. And so this is really acting as a proxy. So if there are other types of networks that you can think about using, then um, it's uh, a viable approach. And one that we've also used are these metabolic pathways. So you can take metabolic pathways, convert a metabolic pathway into a network representation and apply similar approaches. So again, just we're just using the E. coli protein interaction map because it's the only protein interaction map that we have from a model organism perspective. Yes? So, for those network diagrams, I'm assuming that those known sizes are reflecting that total count of... Sorry, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, this is the total RPKM for all the transcripts in your microbiome and a mapping to... But encompassing different taxonomic... Encompassing all the different taxonomic groups, absolutely. Um, so, in, in addition to the uh, physical protein interaction or functional protein interaction networks, we can also use these metabolic pathways. And we've had some discussion over MGRAST and MEGAM, and so you can map your expression onto EC, um, onto ECs, which then map into these networks. And you can color your nodes by relative expression or tile mode for a particular pathway. Um, but one issue with these kinds of approaches with MGRAS, with Megan, is that they rely on these KEG definitions of what a pathway should look like. And KEG is a very well curated metabolic pathway resource, um, but its main focus has been on, again, E. coli, largely yeast, and human. And so a lot of these reactions and a lot of connection between these reactions are inferred from focusing on those three uh, model systems. But we know that there's a whole bunch of other reactions out there which are enabling you to shunt between different substrates in different regions of the network. In addition, you might find that parts of this network are actually, parts of this part are actually part of another pathway somewhere else. And so by having these relatively simple pathway representations, you're actually missing those connections that span across different pathways. And so what, what we uh, attempt to do is these kinds of more of a network-based approach again, where rather than assuming that, and it's, it's not so easy to see, but basically each of these nodes in this particular network here represents a different enzyme classification number, and the links between these different nodes represent common substrates. And so this enables you to take different groups through this network um, that aren't necessarily captured uh, through the keg-defined pathways. Um, and so we can start thinking about um, less of these kind of mo model organism kind of networks that are focused on model organism metabolism and try and identify new routes that different species within your um, 
microbiome I actually be exploiting in order to perform um, maybe similar biochemical reactions. And so what we can start doing, and then this gets into the idea of how we can um, identify which taxa are associated with which dysfunctions, we can use the taxonomic data that we've generated from before, whether it's blue glass, or it's room, medicine, and so forth. We can start mapping these as kind of pie charts, if you like, within these types of networks. So here we have this enzyme, EC 1.2.10.1. It's uh, involved in interconversion with pyruvate to acetyl CoA, and within this particular microbiome, it could be largely mediated by proteobacteria. So you can start using these kind of visualization tools, if you like, to interactively explore your data sets to see what are the keystone taxa which are contributing uh, perhaps important limits within this network. So if you took this one away, are there alternative routes that this microbiome would be able to fulfill in terms of? generating different types of metabolites, or if you take this away, does the whole metabolism collapse and this is performing such a vital function that you no longer have a functioning microbiome? And so does this represent, do the proteobacteria here represent a keystone taxa which are providing a unique functional capacity within this network? Um, so again, we've, that was a bit of a messy view, we've kind of tidied that up. Cytoscape has a really nice plugin now which enables you to do this relatively simply. Um, so, here we don't care about uh, which taxa are responsible for different functions, the size of those are indicated with the additive expression of each of these different um, genes or, uh, or processes within this particular um, cell biogenesis module. But then we can use pie charts, again using the Cytoscape plugin, to actually represent the relative contributions associated with uh, each of these different functions. So we might find that these four cell wall biogenesis genes here, uh, a lot of these are contributed by this pink taxa, which I think are often yards. And so maybe they're performing um, um, these kinds of functions and they're upregulating them uh, as part of their. Um, um, way in which they're generating their cell wall. So the cytoscope is just a really lovely tool in order to take the kinds of data sets that we're generating um, after processing all these sequences and to represent these nodes, these proteins, if you like, within these systems as pie charts or donuts even, which allows you to look at the relative contributions um, of different taxa. All right. Only three more slides before coffee. Yes, Rob. So, <clears throat> so we do have uh, we do have a couple of these, and I I don't have a slide showing this on foot. Well, do I? <clears throat> nope. Um, so we do have a slide which shows four of these from four different mice. And you can see subtle variations between the relative contributions of different taxa, but they all look generally pretty similar. Okay, so we could suppose that those are relatively. You can see see those as not even different time points, but different um, um, different biological replicates even. Uh, and they look pretty similar in a way that they look completely different to the kimchi, to the deep sea, uh, and to the other taxa. And so that's all we can say at the moment because we don't have any other data sets that we're able to compare against. So at this kind of level where we're comparing between these mouse replicates and we're comparing them to kimchi and so forth, you really are able to see taxonomic contributions that make sense from a biologist's perspective uh, that are contributing to 
these different functions. So the kimchi is dominated with lactobacilli and with leuconostox, and these are the two main uh, species that are using kimchi fermentation. Whereas here we see a lot more uh, Clostridiales and Bacteroides, which again we expect to see within a mouse gut. And then the deep sea we're seeing a lot more proteobacteria and delta proteobacteria, which we don't see in any of the other data sets. So it does seem that you do get these kind of unique signatures associated with these systems um, that is representative of the microbiome that you're sampling. Yeah, so again, just to emphasize that we've only done this comparison for four or five different data sets um, where we process everything exactly the same way. But it looks very promising, this kind of approach. Okay, finally, last two slides. Statistical considerations. So metatranscriptomics, I'm trying to keep emphasizing. It's exciting, it's new, but there's still a lot of progress to be made in development of software and tools for metatranscriptome uh, analysis. So there's no dedicated software or statistical tool for statistical comparisons of metatranscriptomic data sets. We're kind of on our own. We're not even sure of how many biological replicates, which kind of feeds into Rob's question. How many replicates do we really need to know to see how, vari how, much, how much variance we can identify, not just in the samples and the generation of the mRNAs themselves, but also in the downstream processing. So we suggest at least two, practically at least three, but again, these are expensive experiments. Um, power analyses. So we come across reviewers and they ask for some kind of power analyses, which seems a fairly valid point, but how we actually go about doing these power analyses for these kinds of experiments uh, is very much um, back of the envelope calculations at the moment. Differential expression of individual genes, can we identify those? So there are a couple of tools which we can start to think about applying to it for differential expression of individual genes, or if we're thinking about um, if we're thinking about genes and how we're mapping the reads though, we have to also remember that these genes might be reads mapping to a group of homologs of an identical gene. And we can start thinking about gene set enrichment analyses to identify which are the functional modules which have been differentially expressed from one samples to another. So given these problems with the involved replicates of power analyses, at the moment we're really viewing the transcriptomics as a hypothesis generating um, kind of uh, procedure requiring subsequent targeted validation. So you can run these experiments, you can identify where well, this component here, or this complex here, or this pathway here, seems to be generating an awful lot of this um, particular enzyme which produces this metabolite. Maybe this is a metabolite that we want to do our targeted metabolomics on. And this is a similar kind of analysis to what was done with the metagenomics um, analysis on obesity that was published about a year and a half ago, where they identified these different taxonomic groups and they identified pathways associated with these taxonomic groups that were upregulated in an obese twin versus a non-obese twin, and then lo and behold, they do the targeted metabolomics, and they were able to validate what their metagenomics experiments initially did. Okay, so while there are no dedicated tools for metatranscriptomics analyses, there are these RNA-seq um, methods, DE-seq, HR, Aldex is a new one. Aldex is um, a tool that was developed by a colleague in London, Ontario, Gregory Glore. And he does, uh, I'd encourage you to read that paper. Um, it's based on Aldex 2. I think it just came out last year or so. It does a very nice explanation as to why some of these other methods, such as the EC and HR, which initially were applied to micro-experiments, why some of the assumptions of micro micro experiments don't hold true for RNA-seq and why uh, Aldex is an improvement in terms of the assumptions associated with uh, RNA-seq versus micro -A. Uh An alternative is to simply rely on bulk change rather than use those kinds of experiments. So can you identify these modules again where you see huge differences um, in groups of related functions of genes uh, that are related and you can feed these into gene set enrichment? 
And then there are challenges as to which genes you include. Should you should there be a minimum RPKM cutoff and say that anything below, say, an RPKM of a certain value, very poor representation, maybe this is noise, maybe we don't consider this in these kinds of analysis. Sorry, what is RPKM? RPKM. So RPKM is the reads per kilobase of sequence matched per million base per million reads sequenced. So it's a way of normalizing for the length of the transcript. DSIC uses the count, right? RPKM is from count. The DSIC, which is an R package, which they have, they use the read count, which is more, they, they also explain the RPKM is not reliable than the read count. So, there's also an issue with DEC. I, I don't know if the DEC2 is able to overcome this, but the way that you do an RNA experiment is that you're limited to X hundred million reads, which sounds a lot, but you still got only X hundred million reads. With a microarray experiment, when you map on reads onto your microarray, you're unlimited. And so there's no confounding factors that the abundance of one read can affect the abundance of another read. With RNA-seq, the relative abundance of one read can affect the abundance of the other reads. And so DEC and NGR did not take that into consideration because they assumed the same underlying model that the microarray did. Whereas because RNA-seq has this issue of the limited number of reads that you can generate and those interdependencies, that's why ALDEX is uh, reported to be better. What was interesting, we ran these DEC, NGR, ALDEX against our mouse data sets because we did actually have three biological replicates within our mouse data set. And we found that the DC gave us maybe three or four differentially expressed genes, EDGAR maybe two, and ALDEX maybe three, and they were all different. So, again, it just highlights the need when you're applying any of these tools to your data sets that that tool that you're applying can really bias what you actually get out. And so you need to be very critical about how you're looking at the results that are coming out of some of these approaches. Um, and then finally, just mentioned gene center enrichment approaches. So there's a number of different methods out there, and hypergeometric distributions might be one that you could consider using. And with that, we will be on a coffee break.